Hello, everyone. I'm R. Blank, and welcome to another episode of the Healthier Tech Podcast, the podcast about creating a healthier relationship with modern technology. Today, we're going to be talking about the right to be forgotten, which is the right to have private information about a person be removed from internet searches and other directories under some circumstances. This right exists in the European Union. It does not exist in the United States, with a few small exceptions. As you're going to see, this right touches on several significant areas, including privacy, identity, and control, as well as broader social issues such as censorship and cancel culture. When I first heard about this right to be forgotten, I thought, that's a great idea. And I still believe that. But as you're about to hear, it's not quite as simple as I first thought. The issues involved are quite complex and involve a lot of consideration and trade-offs. Because of the degree of nuance and complexity in this topic, today's episode is going to be a little different. We're going to hear from two different voices. One woman who can educate us on the actual law, and then a second woman who can teach us about her lived experience using this right to combat revenge porn. So we can get two very different perspectives on the right to be forgotten. First up, I'm very pleased to welcome Elizabeth Ward to the show. I mean, it's a very interconnected world of the worlds of confidence and breach of confidence and data protection and the right to be forgotten. Liz is the founding director of Virtuoso Legal, an intellectual property focused law firm in the UK. And she has been recognized by media outlets such as the BBC and Forbes as a go to IP expert. Before we begin, a brief word. This podcast is brought to you by my company, Shield Your Body, where it is our mission to help make technology safer for you and your loved ones to enjoy. Inspired by the life's work of my father, Dr. Martin Blank, one of the world's leading EMF scientists, I founded Shield Your Body in 2012, and we provide a ton of great and free resources for you to learn all about EMF radiation, like articles, eBooks, webinars, and videos. And we also have a world-class catalog of laboratory-tested EMF and 5G protection products, from our phone pouch and laptop pad, all the way up to our bed canopy. All of our products are laboratory-tested and include a lifetime warranty. Learn more about our products and why we have hundreds of thousands of satisfied customers around the world at shieldyourbody.com. That's shieldyourbody, all one word, dot com, or click the link in the show notes and use promo code POD to save 15% on your first order with free shipping throughout North America, the UK, and Europe. So with that, let's dive in. Welcome, Liz. Welcome to the Healthier Tech Podcast. Great to chat to you today. (laughs) Thank you so much for making the time. Um, could you just, uh, just to get started, could you briefly talk a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Um, well, I'm an intellectual property specialist. So the core of what I do is deal with kind of the enforcement of technology. I mean, I run a whole legal practice, so there's just, there's more than me, but in my time, I've looked after lots of uh, things that are peripheral really to intellectual property, including cases of breach of confidence excuse me, uh, cases where there has been a loss of privacy for one reason or another and the sort of cases where things have got out into the public domain that shouldn't have got out. And, of course, more recently as a practice, we've done a lot of work with uh, data protection and particularly the impact of the uh, GDPR, which is the latest set of data protection legislation that's hit the UK. So I was actually, before we get to what, what I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you on to talk about, uh, I was intrigued a little bit about what, what, does, uh, what do issues of loss of privacy uh, look like when they reach you know, your desk? Um, well, it's always very difficult. I always uh, liken it to trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, it's a nigh on impossible task, but the sort of things that we see uh, on a day-to-day basis are where secret formulations and so on have been leaked or passed between people. We deal with a lot of um, confidential information as it relates to companies. They share confidential information. They want to make sure that there's a a ring of security around it. So say, for example, you might be a small biotech company and you think this particular subject molecule is looking really interesting. We want to share it with another uh, bigger pharmaceutical company who can do more work on it, who can do more R&D on it, who can take it to further clinical trials. Uh, But again, all that information has to be um, selectively given and shared between the two parties. And then hopefully, um, you know, some kind of 
agreement on the back of it. But in the case there is no agreement to sort of go for, forward and commercialise, then th that information stays retained uh, and is not otherwise disseminated because it's of massive commercial value. Um, so those are more that's more my day to day kind of bread and butter work. But of course, I've dealt with all sorts of things from people complaining about um, information that's been leaked about them individually to sort of corporate theft where there's been wholesale taking of information, downloading of databases and uh, that kind of thing for nefarious purposes. So I, I, I really like that metaphor and I, I think it's uh, probably going to frame a lot of our discussion, which is putting the toothpaste back in the tube. So you, you just said the example of of uh, uh, having you know confidential personal information leaked. I mean, what 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 are the kinds of remedies that that you could have for for a situation like that? Um, well, normally the the instant remedy is some kind of an injunction to stop further leakage going on. So, say for example, <clears throat> you quite often see it where the press have leaked information about some public figure doing something that they shouldn't have done. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, they want to stop that from being published and republished and syndicated. One of the big problems is that once you get a story out there, it's very, very difficult to actually stop it from being syndicated. Um, but we've seen lots and lots of cases of that in the press where, you know, people who are footballers, people who are uh, on the edges of, of celebrity and so on, have various public stories leaked about them, and that can be massively damaging to them. So th that that so that I think getting get, getting this information that uh, <clears throat> pardon me, clear my throat. Um, it's really uh, that the that is the type of infer. Well, let me say it this way: that's the type of situation or scenario. Uh, that the right to be forgotten is specifically designed to address. Is that correct? Um, it's all it's all connected. I mean, it's a very interconnected world of the worlds of confidence and breach of confidence and data protection and the right to be forgotten. They all kind of interweave and link together. But the right to be forgotten relates to your um, uh, ability to write to Google and other search engines, Bing and Yahoo, and say, please uh, take that story down. It's no longer true about me. And uh, I need a right to be forgotten and being known for doing something that was overturned at the Court of Appeal or subsequently turned out to be incorrect information is a way, if you like. I mean, before the internet, you know, we go to a newspaper and serve an injunction on a newspaper and stop them publishing. But newspapers now only account for a very, very small percentage of what's publicised and what goes out into the public domain. Uh, but certainly on <clears throat> social media and on the internet generally, it's very difficult to get a right to be forgotten and to get things taken off uh, the internet. It is possible. It's a massive job for all the search engines, so they will absolutely hate you when you make an application to do it. But there are certain <laughs> circumstances where it is just and right for somebody's uh, reputation to be removed from the internet or, or you know, ill-judged reputation to be removed from the internet. The, the, you mentioned search engines specifically. Is the right to be forgotten specifically targeted at search engines or could it include something like Facebook? Uh, at the moment, it, 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 the case law is related to search engines. Uh, certainly, uh, Facebook and all the other social media platforms will take things down. One of the big problems is, of course, people rehash them and then repost them. And it, you play whack-a-mole to a certain extent then when you try and get things taken down. As we've seen with the local, with the recent sort of the pandemic, and, you know, false information that's put out there by people with another agenda, with an anti-vaccine type agenda and that sort of thing. And what happens is those, those particular kind of stories, if you like, because they've been taken down on mainstream uh, media and platforms is, They've developed platform. They've developed their own platforms, or been broadcast on platforms that are less regulated, and 
also, um, as I say, rehashed, the content is rehashed. It's posted by somebody else and then the search engine or the platform has to track it down again and remove it again or block it again. Hence the toothpaste back in the They are doing that much better than they used to. So we keep we keep referring to this, or I do anyway, as the the right to be forgotten. Mm. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, what what actually is this? Is it is it is it a right reflected in a law? Is it a, a right that's actually a concept across multiple laws? What what actually is legally the right to be forgotten? Well, the right to be forgotten comes a, it comes about as a branch of the uh, the GDPR. It's a, a famous case law back from 2014 in Spain. So it's Europe-wide. In fact, it's global. I think other jurisdictions have got it, although I don't get involved with removing material from other jurisdictions. Um, But I think it's Article 17 of the uh, GDPR now. Don't quote me on that. I might have got it wrong, the section. But it's basically, it, it gives you the right to apply to platforms for them to, and, and request them within certain parameters to take material down. So this is the, the, the law across the EU. It emerged out of case law, but is now part of GDPR, which is the same. So the same law that gives us all those annoying cookie warnings is the same, <laughs> <laughs> the same legislation that, that enacted uh, the, the right to be forgotten. But it sounds like it's still, a, a, from, from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like it's, it's continually evolving. So it's not a it's it's not really a fixed implementation yet, or or am I overreading? Well, no, I think the big problem with all legislation is it follows behind technology. Uh, everything that I deal with in intellectual property has to move on as technology moves on. Um, you know, I'm I've been around since the sort of internet was born as a lawyer, and so I remember what used to happen in the days when people were more concerned about printed material than what went online. Now everything's online. But, of course, technology changes online, platforms change online, regulation globally changes online. So it is really difficult to keep up with it from a legislation point of view. But the fundamental principles are there, I think, in most developed parts of the world, certainly right across Europe, certainly in the USA. But I would imagine that the right to be forgotten is also enshrined in you know, Australian law. It's probably there in Japanese law as well. So, what 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 rights le, le, does would that give me if I if I were a citizen of the EU? Like, if if I posted something really stupid and embarrassing five years ago, uh, would I be able to get that uh, removed? Or right. or yeah, what what does it cover? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, it really tries to remove uh, material from the internet that's incorrect, okay? So if you did something very silly, but it's a matter of public record that you did something silly, you got a criminal conviction for it, or you were otherwise kind of um, uh, exposed, the law then has to do this dance around whether or not uh, you it's justified to take that material down. Now, there may be certain circumstances where material down is is taken down. For example, you committed a criminal offence, and the Kent, and then the Court of Appeal said, "No, you didn't commit that criminal offence. New uh, new evidence has come to light. You've been exonerated, and you might want to then remove all the previous stories about that. And that would be legitimate grounds to have the stories and so on delisted and taken down off the internet. Um, however, if your criminal conviction was upheld," And um, there was, you know, freedom of speech. Say you did something really silly and uh, people criticised you and they've got a right to criticise what you do. Uh, then the, do- the, the law has to look about whether or not those stories are justified on the basis of there being a legitimate public interest there. There being a right for the public to criticise what you did or even to sort of comment on it. And that's where it gets really grey and really, really hazy. Um, we've certainly been approached by people to uh, to have information taken down off the internet. One of the problems is if it's fairly recent, if it's within the last five or six years, and say it's a criminal conviction, 
it's difficult. It's very difficult to get that taken down. The general rule of thumb is the older the material is, so if you did something, say, 10 or 15 years ago, it's much easier to get it delisted than it is that something, say, that you did five years ago. Hmm. So and is this process of delisting, does it involve uh, or removing, whatever, how, however we might want to refer to it, uh, does it involve the courts or is it entirely a private transaction between the, the, the person making the claim and the entity with, that's, that's displaying the information? Yeah, generally speaking, it's an application to the platforms or to the search engines to take material down and to say, this is false information, um, it shouldn't be up there. It's almost parallel with, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Data Protection Act, but the Data Protection Act says if I as a business take material about you and I process it in a particular way, it has to be what they call lawful processing. It has to be accurate. It has to be kept up to date. It has to be something that um, is of, what's the word, um, of use, um, not trivial information about you and so on and so forth. And if it has been unlawfully processed, or if it, for example, is a, a complete uh, work of fiction, then you as an individual have the right to have that taken off your records, whatever those records are. And in a way, the um, right to be forgotten runs parallel in that. It runs in tandem with it. So you've got a right to be forgotten to write to, say, virtuoso legal and say, take me off your database or whatever information you've kept there is completely wrong. Um, and you've also got a right to ask Bing or Yahoo or one of the other search engines to also um, take down information that is about you on the internet, which is manifestly wrong and manifestly unfairly published. Does the consent of the claiming party, the, the person who wants something removed, does, does their consent play anything uh, play any role in the, re- the the validity of the removal request and by, by consent I mean consent at the time of whatever event or information that is uh, was generated that's currently being displayed uh, that's a good question I'm not sure that it does have an impact because circumstances change and you can withdraw consent you can say that's unfair to carry on publishing that about me even though I might not have objected to start with. Um, Again, we're talking sometimes here about the snowball effect. I mean, one thing that's desperately almost impossible to get off the internet are stories that have gone viral, for example. Mm. So where you've got a a one, we had one a few years ago where, uh, well, we've had a couple, one where a gentleman was convicted of fraud uh, and another one where he had fallen out with his financial regulator. And um, both those were relatively straightforward to get taken down because they weren't stories that had been, they'd not gone viral. Um, They had been widely published by different sort of organizations, but they weren't in the sense that you and I would understand. They haven't gone viral. Not everybody had seen them. Um, So those are slightly more easy to deal with than some things which are published everywhere. So are there exclu- like specific exclusions or carve-outs? And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, uh, public figures, politicians, um, famous people. Are, are, are there yeah. exclusions for, 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 for specific people or populations? Um, that's a good, that, again, is another good question. I think for children and so on, uh, even though they may be in the public eye, I think it's far easier to get material about them withdrawn. Um, if you're a famous person, it, it tends to be deemed to be fair game to put material up there, unless it's manifestly, a, you know, absurd and unjustified. In which case, they can, a, a, you know, apply to have it removed. Um, but the more famous you are, the more widely it, things go viral, and the more widely things are broadcast. And certainly, when it comes to written material, uh, the courts take a view there where there's a sort of a an intrusion on somebody's privacy or conf- rights of confidence, um, there's there's more of a bias towards the uh, newspapers being permitted 
to publish it because you are in the public eye. So say, for example, you were a champion of animal rights and that you were then found guilty of or, you know, you were accused of and there was evidence that you, in fact, were guilty of animal cruelty. Um, You know, there would be justification for keeping that in the public eye or for letting the comment there uh, carry on. Uh, but it would be easier to have it delisted if nobody knew who you were than if everybody knew who you were and you were very well known. Um, so, again, that's the difference, if you like, between what the legislation says and what the case law says in court. Because the case law in court basically says if you put yourself in the public domain as a public figure and you then get um, outed for being a bit of a hypocrite, <laughs> um, <laughs> which happens, doesn't it? Yeah, um, I've, I've heard about Boris Johnson's Christmas party. <laughs> the past. <laughs> you mean the work meetings, don't you? The work yeah. meetings. <laughs> Nobody else was having a work meeting, but yes, Boris and his cronies were. If you're outed for being a hypocrite, hey, you're outed, and that's it. And, and that's that. That's fair game. So yeah. I'm wondering, because the, 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 the examples of the platforms you, you cited, uh, Google and Bing, you know, those are those are U.S. companies. Have there been any snags in the actual implementation due to the fact that so many of the the big platforms are American firms? Well, that's a, that's again is an interesting point because there is clear difference between the U.K., for example, and the U.S. in terms of what the U.S. allows for freedom of speech. And this has been a bit of a dilemma, really, with uh, with misinformation that's been put around or or stories that are put around because there's much more restriction over here on what the Brits would consider, would consider, you know, racist or, or, or sexist or um, those kind, that kind of language, which in the States, there's, there's a much more liberal approach in the U S it's freedom of speech. It's people can say what they like. The Brits are much more buttoned up about it. They go, well, you can say what you like, but actually we don't like to offend people. And so there is a bit of a conundrum there. There's a bit of a dilemma and a dichotomy between what is acceptable in the US and what is acceptable over here. So has that hindered, uh, you know, day-to-day implementation and and function of this law in in the UK and in the EU? I think so. I think it, I think the attitudes are, you know, the people who are making those decisions have got different attitudes. So the people in the US have probably got a more libertarian attitude about, uh, you know, freedom of speech than the average Brit would. Um, yeah, no, and I, I like where that where that answer is going because I, I, I where I what one one of the important things I, I I wanted to to get to in this interview is because it, it is. I mean, I when I read about the uh, right to be forgotten, it sounds like a very valuable tool. And yet at the same time, I am a proponent of freedom of speech. Yeah. And that seems to be sort of an essential conflict at the heart of this right. And do, do you agree with that? And you know, what, what do you see in that conflict? It's a very difficult judgment call. And to a certain extent, it's cultural. Um. The, the as I say, there's much more freedom of speech in the US than the is in the UK. You do not have the right over here to sort of uh, publicly um, criticize people for their um, color, for example, the color of their skin or for their for their gender, um, and that's considered far more fair game in the states than it is over here. The, in the states, the though. Don't accept it. The public don't accept it in the states. I'm not saying that there is a an acceptance by the average American of that kind of language. I think they. No, no, I. Forced, yeah, no, I, wasn't. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't take it that way. But thank you for the disclaimer. No, the what I was going to say is in in the states, freedom of speech is 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 a right for people to not have the government silence them. It does not protect people from not having uh, Google silence them or YouTube silence them, as we're we're seeing with these deplatforming actions. So, the actual enforcers of this right, they are under no obligation, even in the United States, to guarantee consumers freedom of speech. So the 
Do you, do you, do you kind of see oh, where right. I, was... I, see, I do? I see where you're going. I completely see where you're going. Um, I think it's just generally more culturally accepted that in the States you've got this freedom of speech and people will use a platform much more. They'd think much more carefully over here because we have a whole raft of legislation that would immediately be invoked regardless of how they um, performed their free speech. I see. I, I would also, and uh, you know, this is just my opinion here. I, I suspect that when, when you're talking about mindsets and cultural prejudice uh, from the United States, there is a prejudice towards uh, believing that if technology enables something, it is good. So it's not just about freedom of speech. It's about not hindering the progress of technology. And if you're coming in and saying you have to change uh, the content, you know, the, the, the bias would be to why? Why should I? Because the technology enabled this speech. Why should we alter the uh, alter and, and and limit and restrict? Put artificial limitations on what the technology is enabling us to do. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it is. So, you you talk about filing a form, uh, or, or it's not just a form, but you, you you submit a request to the to the to these companies. Let's say there's something a, a search result on Google. It's pretty clearly under, you know, falls under this right. Uh, what is the process? And, and really what I'm hoping to get to there is, is this like the kind of thing that a regular person can take advantage of? Or do you need um, a, a lawyer uh, such as yourself or per perhaps a PR firm? You know, how easy is this to enforce uh, for, for people? Um. It's, they can do it. It is designed for people to make their own applications. I think the difficulty for doing it without guidance, and I'm not saying that PR firms don't have guidance because they, possibly they do, but without a lawyer looking at it, it, you have to then work out exactly how your case fits into the legislation. And I think that's the difficulty for a lot of people. Yes, they can do it. Yes, Google uh, uh, and on all these other platforms enable you to to file it yourself and you have to file things like your, you know, copy of your driver's license or your passport to show that you are who you purport to be. Um, but as I say, sometimes if there are subtle nuances, we find people come to us because they then need to navigate around them. Has there is there a way of gauging how much activity there is under this law? Like how many of these requests are, are happening? Well, I, I think it's difficult to know. I don't know of any system that monitors it. I do know that there is a, allegedly a lot of applications. And because of that, um, the search engines in particular can be very slow to respond. Now, they're required to respond under the GDPA within, I think it's uh, two months. I, again, don't quote me on that. But they're supposed to respond relatively quickly. Uh, and turn it around but i know that they can say well look this is more complicated than we think we've got a backload of, backload of cases we need more time and i've known it take months actually to get any kind of response from uh, google in particular um they say that's because of the volume of cases who knows because we've just had a pandemic it may be that they're short-staffed it may be that there's all sorts of things playing on in the background that we don't know about so when I came into this interview, I came in with the, um, let's say, the bias that this was a, uh, a, a useful and valuable uh, right, that, that it, it helps give some important powers back to people uh, because of just how, how prevalent technology is and how accessible information is because of that technology. As we've been talking about this, uh, however, it seems, you know, while I still agree that a right like this makes a lot of sense, it certainly feels a lot messier than perhaps I was thinking, uh, you know, half hour ago. So, you know, with that, what, what are your personal, if I can ask, you know, your personal views on this? Right? Is, it a, is it a good right? Is it, is it structured properly? Is it, could it, how, how could it be improved? Um, a messy is exactly the word that I would use. It is messy um, because it, the, well, the big problem with it is, is in theory it works. In theory, it's useful. In practice, it's difficult to apply. In practice, uh, with certainly more subtle cases, you probably do need legal help or an expert of some kind to 
help you move around it. And as I say, it somewhat dances between freedom of speech, what's fair, criticism and review, what is legitimate to be in the public domain, what is known, what is known to be fact, what is known to be fiction. And it actually gets very woolly indeed to actually pull things off the internet. That's not to say that people don't try and do do achieve it, but it's not straightforward. And I, uh, I'm sorry, I was just realizing, well, what, what, what is, so let's say you, you submit one of these requests to Google. Uh, I assume that they have a, a, a team of attorneys reviewing these requests. So it's handled by, by a group of attorneys. And then they come out with a, um, uh, uh, they decline the request. Are there options left to that, uh, uh, that consumer, that claimant, um, if, 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 for instance, Google rejects the request? Well, I think it's a very big assumption that they actually employ attorneys at a first level. Okay. Most, of the, most of the platforms uh, will employ administrators uh, of one kind or another who are who have you know a background to what the problem is and what the solutions are and what the rules are around that. Hmm. Um, I've never been to any kind of an appeal process, um, but I would assume that there are appeal processes there uh, because that's the way that you can do it. And of course, ultimately, you can run off to the court and say, "Look." Google have treated me badly here. Uh, please overrule what Google say, Mr. Judge. So there are there are those rights of appeal rather than the internal processes of different platforms. Okay. Are there are there are there any? Um, I mean, this has been very informative for me, and I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to 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 come on the Healthier Tech Podcast to to share this information. Uh, before we we sign off, and I let you get back to your day. Um, are there any aspects of this that, that, that you would like to, to highlight or that you feel I missed? I think the process should be made clearer. I think it's about as clear as mud for the average applicant. There are plenty of people out there who have been wronged by what's put out on the internet and have very little right of redress. And I think it's really time for us to sit back as, a, uh, as one world, not just in the UK, not just in Europe, but as one world, to sit back and look at what is broadcast on the internet and whether or not it's fair and how quickly and how effectively you can get things removed because it has been the wild west out there and it's so you know the legislation is very recent there's a lot of historic information on google that's wildly inaccurate and we've got a, a nation of youngsters who are coming up through the ranks who rely on information that's there and it's wrong there's there's, there's there's just so much misinformation out there. So my plea to the legislators would be, and in fact the platforms, would be to take more notice of this particular right uh, and to streamline the processes and streamline the, as far as you can anyway, the rules which govern it because it's not clear. Um, yeah, and I, 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 I agree with what you're saying uh, based on based on what you've taught me today about this. Right, I also feel it's it's very uh, very much in line with a lot of the uh, the to our view here at the Healthier Tech Podcast of a lot of the topics that we cover, which is there needs to be a a, a more mindful approach um, to our relationship with technology. We've gone now decades uh, just kind of accepting every new innovation as, as a societal good. And, you know, technology has done a tremendous amount of good quite clearly, but it just accepting everything that comes along with it as a good is, is, is leading us down some interesting and perhaps not so positive paths. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today to help uh, educate me on how the uh, right to be forgotten falls, falls into that. So thank you so much. Uh, no problem. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, again, this was uh, Liz Wart, and you can visit and learn more about her firm at virtuosolegal.com and follow her on Twitter at Elizabeth M. Ward 1. Thank you again, Liz. Thank you. Okay. So now that we know a bit more about what the right to be forgotten actually is, let's turn next to Amy Christopher. Amy is a British sports presenter, journalist, and award-winning social media influencer. 
Amy has a huge interest in sports, but that's not what we'll be talking about today. Instead, I'm pleased to have Amy on the show so we can discuss her personal experience with what it's like to actually experience the right to be forgotten in her own life. So let's get to the interview. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you so much for for making the time to to come onto the Healthier Tech Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. (laughs) (laughs) So for those of my listeners who, who may not yet know you, could, could you please t- uh, just talk a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background? Okay, so um, I'm a former glamour model turned sports presenter, and I recently did a reality show called Married at First Sight. Cool. And like for- I did not meet my everlasting husband, unfortunately. <laughs> so still available, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so today we're here talking about the right to be forgotten. And I thought a good, a good entry point into that. I read a quote from you, um, in the sun and in it, you say, I have a right for it to be forgotten about. And so, as, like I say, as a starting point, could you, could you talk a little bit about what, what it was you were, you were talking about there and how you came to learn the term right to be forgotten? Yeah. So Obviously, putting yourself out there on a reality TV show, a lot of people, you know, try and find things out about you, Um, tabloids especially, and, you know, viewers and things are intrigued to see who you are, especially if you're on there saying, I'm a former glamour model, then they're going to go searching for those pictures and things like that. Um, But a lot of them I did get removed because... I went from glamour modeling into sports presenting, which is obviously a whole another ball game, pun intended. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to sort of smarten up my image. Um, yeah, it was just very different background, you know. So, some people in sport didn't mind it. Other people were a bit like frowned upon it. Personally. I'm totally okay with my glam modeling. I'm very proud of those days. However, there was one incident during my glam model days, which kind of got taken out of context. So I used to do Natsu loaded FHM page three. So all the lab mags, that sort of thing. And back then, if you were a household name in glamour, then the TV channels would really want you to be on there. So those are the phone lines where you're sat chatting, people have to pay £2.50 a minute to speak to you. You know, they're they're your fans and they want to speak to you. So I was doing daytime, so that's just literally, oh, what are you doing? You're doing your gardening. Oh, lovely. Like, oh, yeah, lovely weather we're having. Like proper (laughs) just normal conversations. Sometimes you do a few little innuendos in there, you know, like a few cheeky things like, you know, keep it flirty, not dirty, guys. That was our motto. Um, nighttime was a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, uh, and then, so with working on these channels, they would do trips away to get loads of content for the website. So that would include photo shoots, strips, teases, and then POV videos and things as well. So they would put these out out on their members only sites um and be like well we've got this trip coming up like vote for the girls that you want to do certain things and this that and the other because it's all about fantasy all of these things so anyway they said that they wanted a pov video of a threesome with me and this other model cara because we were very close friends so you know we're like oh my god really this is such a like we're just like oh let's have some wine it'll be fun whatever so it's one of our producers filming us who's supposed to be the boyfriend. So, you know, this is like, we're just absolutely pissing our pants at this. So like, oh my God, is this actually happening? Like, and, you know, on the other side of it, you know that there's going to be some like guy that is one of the viewers of said stations and things like that. And like, they're going to just absolutely be thinking it's real. And you're like, no, it's absolutely not. So we're like laughing in between, like as soon as the camera goes off, it's like, you can even like hear us laughing. And it was just so cringe. And then I was doing like 
some phony American accent thinking I'm really super sexy and all of this lot. Cause, you know, like we just like to, to get into the roles and things like that. Because for us, it was a bit of fun, you know, like you're literally pretending to be somebody else and all of this sort of stuff. Anyway, so it was a very tongue in cheek fantasy video POV and it basically got taken out of context and then it got put onto Pornhub and all of these other things and when they asked me and Cara to do it they said don't worry it's nobody can copy the video nobody can do whatever it's literally um just gonna be on our website people can download it onto their phone that's it but they can't reshare it and all of this stuff so that was that. And I'm like 20 at this time. So I'm just like, oh, whatever. I've had a glass of wine. Yeah, that sounds like a fun idea. Why not? It'll be a laugh. And then not really considering the consequences. I knew that I wanted to be a sports presenter when I grew up, <laughs> when I was older and things like that. But I never thought that this would be something that would come and bite me in the ass. And then, well, until two years later, three years later, four years later, this video keeps appearing and I'm like, <laughs> this was never meant to see the light of day. What is going on? So yeah, I spoke to the channel and I was like, can we get this removed? They're like, we've taken it down, but people have copied it. I was like, but hold on a minute. You told me that they weren't allowed to copy it. So how have they done that? Um, yeah. So these with text, they, they always find a loophole, don't they? <laughs> you guys probably know all about that. <laughs> So yeah, it was just a bit like, oh, right, okay. So from that point on then, I knew that this video was going to be a problem and it haunted me for like the rest of my career, basically up until this summer when somebody sent it to the sun and then it was this big Amy porn star, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh my God. But because it was put on Pornhub, that's why they could say porn because it's on Pornhub. But it's actually not porn. It's just, you know, some fantasy pretend thing. And it's just, yeah, like there's a bit of topless, but that's it. There's no like sexual activity in it at all. And, you know, that to me is just what my whole glamour career was, topless. And then it's just moving. Do you know what I mean? It's been visual. So for me personally, I didn't think that it was, any different really at the time but then it's just how people take things out of context and then that then has been sent to previous employers did you know you've got a porn star working for you this that and the other when I'm there like presenting sports news and I'm like this is really not very helpful luckily a lot of my employers have been very understanding like they get it they're like this isn't porn it's fine but it's just the fact that people think that they have a right to go through your past and try and bring you down when clearly you've moved on from that stage in your life. So therefore, you should have a right to be forgotten. You know, people, a lot of people do a lot of silly things in their teens and things like this, you know, like I'm sure you probably did some things when you were a teenager that oh, you're like, no, wow. No. Not me, no. Not you, yeah. no. <laughs> no <I'm kidding. laughs> okay. Of course, every everyone does. So, so you 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 felt like it should have you should have this right for it to be forgotten. Did you know that you had a right for it to be forgotten? So I did kind of start looking into that because I also paid a lot of money when I was going into sports presenting to get quite a lot of my nude shoots and things like that taken off the internet, and I spoke to quite a lot of these different websites and things from these babe channel ones because to be honest it's just the babe channel ones that were the issue because of the way things get taken out of context and you know on these babe channels you've got three different tiers so you've got the daytime which is what I did then you've got nighttime which is obviously a lot more raunchier and then you've got the porn so it's like okay but I was in the bottom tier of that like I wasn't up there so you know yeah so that for me was the main issue to get my association away from that because that's what could have been damaging and you know quite a lot of them were like okay cool we'll, we'll take them off and also I just feel like with things like that 
okay, so I did those things over 10 years ago now. You're still making money out of that, out of me, when you paid me like what? Probably £250 for that one shoot. So no, like you have earned enough money off me. I have a right for that to be taken down. And actually you should be paying me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so how in this process, I mean, how it, it sounds like you, you hired a, an expert or a, an agency maybe to, to help you with this. How, do, how does that process work? So, yeah, I just um, had one of my lawyer friends help me out and uh, we basically just, we're messaging them like, look, copyright, right of image, things like that. And also just stating the fact that you have had this up for over 10 years. You've earned a lot more money than you originally paid her. So, you know, out of the kindness of your heart, could you please take these down, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so it's actually more the like lawyer fees and things like that rather than having to pay them to take it down because they're not making a loss. They've, they've had over 10 years of, guys doing whatever they do when they look at my pictures and whatever and spending that money. So, yeah. Sure. So that, that was the original publisher, but it, it, as you said, it had been copied and and reposted in multiple places. Was that, that, that's a separate process? Yes. Or. Yeah. So, I mean, the hardest part was, is, well, it's not the hardest part because as I'll say in a minute, it gets a lot more complicated than more people that copy things and whatever. It's like a big spider web. You've got to go and contact all these different people then. So that's very time consuming. But essentially it is, we will sue your asses if you keep posting this. You don't have the copyright. You're not the original publisher. So therefore you're not allowed to use this. That part's quite easy. But again, it's just tracking everybody down that's used that, reposted it. And then some people are like, well, we bought it off them. So then that's when it gets a bit hazy. And then you go back to the originals and you're like, did you sell it to X, Y, and Z site? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you didn't actually tell me about that. So therefore, I should have got some royalties from that as well. So yeah, it just, it gets very, very confusing. And yeah, there's there's a lot of snakes out there, basically. Like (laughs) that wasn't in the small print because I always read all of the small print. And actually, when I was modeling... I had a fake name and I always signed it with the fake name and no one ever questioned it in all of my babe channel days and all of that. Nobody ever questioned the fact that I've had to show them my passport to go on this trip and it says my name's Amy Christopher's, but I've signed it Brandy Brewer. But I always did that because I was smart and I was like, if this ever comes down to a court of law, I didn't sign shit. You don't own the rights <laughs> to this at all. Get it the fuck off the internet. <laughs> so how, how, how long did this process or is it still going or is it, is I mean, it, yeah, is it it's, continual it's forever ongoing? Like I'm always okay. having like, so I, I have my lawyer friend that he'll message me if something's like popped back up. Cause he's got Google alerts for like certain phrases and things like that. But yeah, so he contacted, um, Pornhub originally said, look, this, this phrase cannot be allowed back on. So like this video, so Brandy, Brandy Brewer, um, you know, through all of it, like a sentence was not allowed to be put back on. And then obviously then when I went into married at first sight, these people have been sat on this and they're like, ah, she's known now under a different name. Let's put it up under her real name. And, you know, and then the whole thing starts again. So yeah, there's, um, I think, I think we did actually have something that they couldn't put it under Amy Christopher's because that's when I was doing my sports presenting. But I think then it changed to like Amy Maths. So there was like a way around it. And then I'm like, oh my God, how many more phrases do I need to get banned from bloody Pornhub? Be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> to be so fair though, like the video is literally so harmless that, that now with it actually going out in the Sun newspaper and like everybody talking about it and stuff, I kind of feel like, oh, my dirty secret's out there now. Like I don't, I've, I've addressed it now and I'm like, well, whatever, it's done now. So I don't need to be made to feel ashamed of it because hiding that secret like makes you feel dirty and ashamed. But actually, if you watch it, you'll, you'll just laugh. You're like, this is clearly a joke. Like, it's whatever. So, yeah, but I just feel like I shouldn't have been put in that position to start with, you know. If I say I don't want that video out there anymore, it shouldn't be there. You know, that was a long time ago. I moved away from all of that. 
So, yeah. so but this sounds like a process that maybe is re- required you to to have more will, uh, more knowledge, and and perhaps a little more money than than a lot of people might 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 have. Yeah. Or oh, exactly. I mean, I, I'm not like loaded or whatever. Like. <laughs> I didn't want to have to spend money on this stuff, but I was like, I don't think I'm going to have a thought through if like all of this stuff comes out. But yeah, so for like, I, I don't know, there's just, there should be a right to be forgotten and it shouldn't have to cost you loads of money. It should just be your God given right. But if you don't want something out there anymore, you feel like you're not that person anymore. I mean, within reason, I mean, if people have, you know, done really bad stuff, like, murdered people or you know things like that maybe you know <laughs> but yeah I think for for normal things like I don't know say somebody's a police officer now or something and I don't know they posted a a topless selfie once or something like that and then somebody digs that out and then that stops them becoming a police officer I don't know if that would happen by the way um just totally putting it out there, but things like that, you know, that's yeah. So, so uh, you, 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 after fighting, you know, this hard, and it sounds like you're still, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process uh, to have your past forgotten. You also now have a, a massive social media presence. Um, get, what have you learned from, from this experience? What have you learned about how you approach your, your social media these days? Um, I just want to say that I am not ashamed about my <laughs> former career. I'm very proud of it. I worked very hard to get where I got to and things. But literally just the one thing that I regret was that video. Well, it's some, maybe some amateur dodgy shoots when I was first starting out <laughs> that look awful. Um, yeah. Things that you want to be down. Like, for instance, the other day um, on my social media, a girl messaged me. And she, she had print screened a tweet that I did, um, I don't know, five years ago or something. She goes, just to let you know, like, there's still topless pictures of you on your Twitter. And my response was like, oh, and? <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I was just like, okay. And I thought, like, that's really sweet of her to, like, to do that. But, like, that's okay. Like, I'm, I'm not too bothered about things like that. It's more people trying to bring you down by thinking a certain way. You know, so this video, people be like, oh, yeah, let's use this against her and whatever. But the thing is, like, I've owned it all now. So I've taken away anybody's power for it. But the point is, I spent, like, over 10 years fearing that this video was going to come out into, like, the public domain and things like that. And it's like the anxiety and things that that has caused me. It shouldn't be, like that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. So, so you believe that the uh, the right to be forgotten is effectively a should be a universal human right. And 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 just by the way, just in case you don't know, the right to be forgotten does not exist in the United States. Um, <laughs> which, uh, but but it does obviously in the in in in, in Europe. But you also, you, you think, you mentioned there should be some limits to the right to be forgotten. How, how do you, as someone who's had to go through this process, how do you view that, that balance between everyone should have this right, but there need to be some limits? What would be a way of, of striking that balance in a way that is fair, for lack of a better term, and accessible to, to most people who, who may not have all the, um, uh, the resources that you do? Mm. I mean, it's a really tough one, isn't it? Like, how, how do you control what is allowed to be forgotten and what's not? Um, I mean, I don't think that's really on my shoulders to say what don't. should be. I'm, I'm sure there's people <laughs> far smarter out there that, that um, could do a better argument than myself. But I just think, I don't, I don't know, like, I just know, like, personally for me, I can, so I can only speak for myself, of the fact that I wasn't a born star, but I've been taken out of context and to mm-hmm. make something else. And, you know, without knowing all of the facts, 
people can come up with their own conclusions and things. And then that's when it's harmful because they try and use that against you when they don't know the originality of it. So things like that. And I just think if that video had just been forgotten about and like somebody just pressed like control on delete or whatever, like boom, that's gone. It's gone forever. Then like it would have been plain sailing. Well, I'm not plain sailing, but do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, that's something is, that wouldn't have happened, but I don't yeah, but know. It, I don't like. I don't know yourself, but I, I don't know. What do you want to be forgotten about from ten years ago that you did? <laughs> I like to not be known in the first place. Um, <laughs> that's that's my approach. But uh, no, I mean, you're you're yeah. I, I, I'm not asking you just because you know you get to decide. I, I was asking you as someone who's gone through this process. Um, because it does, I mean, to, to your point, you, you just said, you know, hitting delete and getting rid of, you know, an aspect of your past. But as you noted, you know, that's just not how tech works, right? Because mm -hmm. it's never, some things are essentially never deleted. Gone. And, it's never and really so, gone. Yeah. So your digital trail becomes part of your identity. And, and this is something, you know, I, I, it's not really off topic, but, you know, I, uh, I think about these uh, kids that are growing up today um, with, you know, because when I grew up, you know, we didn't, we didn't even have, the web wasn't invented until I was 16. And Facebook wasn't uh, invented until I was, uh, I think, what was I, 30 or something? So, like, we didn't have these, these opportunities to, to uh, create these permanently accessible records of your brainlessness <laughs> the way that kids do today and the trails that they're creating. And you, you read article, I read articles all the time about, you know, someone applying for a job and they find the employer, they accept, they accept the job. Then someone found some horrible, horribly embarrassing photo of them from a frat party in college and the job was rescinded. And I, so I, that's all by way of saying I'm super grateful that I didn't have to grow up in in the environment that that kids are growing up in today because mm -hmm. I, I I don't think people have actually grappled with these issues uh, the way that to 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 their full impact I I think we're just kind of sailing along and I think this way about a, a lot of the implications of technology we're we're just sailing along we assume that because tech is there it's cool and we should use it and there's no harm. And then the harm is revealed years and years later. So that, that was the, the reason I'm asking you is not necessarily because you're an expert or in jurisprudence or EU law or human rights, but because you're someone who's actually gone through this and you felt the things that you have felt about being tied down to a, not, not, not even just an aspect of your identity uh, from the past, but the the perception of an aspect of your identity from the past or rather a misperception and so that that was kind of what i was trying to get at which is you know as someone who's gone through that process how how would you what are your thoughts on how the how how this how society should be viewing these rights that that was that was really the 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 kind of the gist of the question not to put you on the spot but trying to get some some of that insight uh, yeah, I mean, you know, most people got drunk, things like that. Personally, for me, I'm, I'm not, I'm probably from like a generation a little bit younger than yourself, but just a little bit younger. So, you know, we had like Bebo, MySpace, things like that. I think my MySpace is still out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> God, please forget that. Um, and yeah, you know do silly things and say silly things and upload things. And I think, especially now with this whole like cancel culture, you know, people could be on a reality show an old tweet gets found and things like that. It's like, should we be canceling that person or shall we see if they've actually grown from that? And maybe if they haven't grown and they still have that same kind of mentality, then educate them because education is key to moving forward and making a better society. Because I'm not being funny. I don't know any teenager that isn't cocky and thinks they bloody know it all and they're arrogant and they don't want to learn anything because I know it all and all of this lot. And then they put those 
thoughts out into the Twitterverse and all of that, and then it's like, yeah, that's going to bite you in the ass one day. But it's my it, that it's not going to be the same thing that they think when they're in their thirties. So, yeah, I think things like that as well need to be taken with a little bit a pinch of salt. Um, definitely, you know, I've never been to a frat party. They look like massive fun though. Like I've watched a lot of films. <laughs> <laughs> but if I was at a frat party, oh my God, I'd probably never have another job. Do you know what I mean? I know it's hard. <laughs> so yeah, if there was like photographic evidence and things like that of like when I was younger, going out clubbing and things, yeah, I would not have a job and I would have nobody respect me at all. <laughs> so yeah, I think with things like that, if you're going for a job, like, a little part of me thinks is it even right that these employers should be like going through your personal life to that much detail from your past because is that the person that you are there sat in front of them at that job interview no it's not nobody's the same person 10 years on I don't think and if you are then you need to have a really hard look at yourself because you're doing life wrong (laughs) yeah and you're, you're not the same person at work that you are at home or at a party Exactly. So, and if you can yeah. conduct yourself in a professional manner and you get your job done, then unless you're going out, you know, killing people at the weekends, I don't think it's really <laughs> any of that business what you do. Do you know what I mean, though? Like, you yeah. can go out and have a drink with your friends, let loose. Like, I always remember, you know, going into school, looking at your teachers and you think, God, they're so boring. And then in my, like, 20s and whatever I was living with teachers and I was like teachers are wild oh my god (laughs) again you don't think that as a child in school you think oh Mrs. So-and-so she's so boring and whatever and then you know next minute you see them you know on a night out whizzing around a pole and down in pints and putting them on their heads and stuff do you know what I mean you're like oh everybody's allowed to have you know a work personality and then go out and enjoy themselves without being judged for it yeah. So, so you, if I, if, if, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, your view is that people should be able, should, should be able to be empowered to have the, um, the ability to curate their digital record. And that they, again, with certain exceptions, like, I mean, an extreme one, but murderers yeah. and, and, and criminals. And other horrible things, yeah. Yeah, other horrible things. People should be allowed to curate their their records. And over time, they should be able to go back and say, you know what? I don't want that out there anymore um, because I don't want that to be a part of an identity that people perceive of of mine. Is is that fair? Is yeah. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, so that-, and, that re- and also- yeah. um, you know, just going to the royal family quickly. Um, <laughs> like Catherine, she did a she did that fashion show where she met William, or like you know they were at university together. That picture's probably haunted her forever now. You know, oh with the sheer bit. Oh, can you see her nipples and whatever? And it's like, oh my god, get over it. She was like eighteen. She was in a school fashion show. Like relax. But again, that picture is out there it's always going to be brought up in certain things. And I just think, no, she has a right for that to be forgotten. Same with Meghan Markle. Somebody had topless pictures of her. Again, right to be forgotten. That shouldn't be out there. So certain things like that. I think if things are being used to try and drag you down and degrade somebody, I think totally out of order. Yeah. Well, um, where, uh, where can, uh, wh- where would you like my listeners to go find, uh, to, to go learn more about you? <laughs> Not Pornhub. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stay away from that. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not on it now. Um, so I am on all social networks as that sports spice. And that's it really. I- Excellent. <laughs> so Amy, thank you so much. I, 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 I mean, from my perspective, you are, you, uh, I, you're at sort of at the forefront of engaging with an issue that is not only very important, but that will impact more and more and more people over time. And in that sense, uh, you're kind of like a, a guinea pig. And I, I know that that's not an enviable position. And so, you know, my sympathies for for what you've had to go through. Uh, but I also really appreciate you taking the time to come onto the Healthier Tech podcast 
and and share your story. And I also am I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very heartened to see you know your approach to this, where it, it feels like this is this has really empowered you and your identity and your new career. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, for ages I wanted the right to be forgotten, and you know all of that. But then with it coming out, you know, I just owned it. But the point is in professional senses when you're going for a job interview and like you said a party picture of you at a frat party or whatever comes out like that person sat in front of that employer isn't going to be empowered and feel like that they're going to feel like oh okay and they're not going to get that job which isn't helpful you know I think I'm only able to say that I can own it and whatever because I am in this position where I have a platform and I've got a voice and I can say that but you know, to the average person that's getting not getting a job and being sacked because of something that they did when they was at a frat party years and years ago, like that's really unfair. No, totally. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. No, I I, I agree. I, I feel like the 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 your experience is is unique for I, I think for several reasons, but you know, not least of which is that just an average person losing a job because, or I, I, you know, your reference to cancel culture that I thought that was really, really, um, uh, very relevant to this topic where, you know, I've seen, I, I don't remember all of them offhand and I didn't, I didn't prep them for this interview, but you see stories almost every week where someone had a tweet 10 years ago and, you know, they just love, you know, they, they just got a job and a 10 year old tweet, maybe from college, maybe from high school was resurfaced and they immediately lose their job. And um, it, it, the, the cancel culture is, 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 is kind of a separate issue, but it ties into this one so, so mm. tightly. And I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And, but getting back to the, the point, which is most people or a lot of people wouldn't have uh, the gumption as well as the resources to sort of confront this head on the way that you did. Which is, which is why this is, I think, such an important topic for people to be talking about, because this is something that uh, society really does need to, to it, 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 there's no easy answer, but there needs to be a discussion about a way to come to terms with people's right to control their identity um, versus the way that technology is just built to, to operate and interact with society. So again, thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the Healthier Tech Podcast today. Uh, I really enjoyed getting the chance to meet and talk with you. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, as always, I am joined here by my co-host, uh, Stephanie. Steph, what did you, uh, what did you think of that, uh, that interview? Woo. Well, <laughs> uh, that was a fantastic interview, and I, you know, I came into this interview thinking I had an understanding of the complexity and the importance of the right to be forgotten, and I left with really under realizing that you know how how complex it really is, and and messy is definitely. I don't see any way it couldn't be a messy. Implement, uh, implementation because it does, you know, really hit our fundamental rights of, you know, freedom of speech, trying to define what should be taken down versus, you know, what somebody would like to have taken down versus what, you know, really should be. And I, it, it's just so much more complicated than I realized. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I came into this really just focused on the importance of it. And I mm-hmm. didn't really think at all about the cleanliness and the complexity of how it would work in real life. I, I, I like, uh, I wrote this down as soon as she said it, the toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, that is, uh, I mean, how do you uh, put the toothpaste back in the tube? And uh, obviously you can't in that metaphor, but you can kind of clean it up a little. And, well, that's, and that's really what the law seems to be aimed at. Yeah. And in that, in that metaphor too, the, you know, obviously you want your toothpaste back in the tube, but the, the, some things shouldn't be some things, you know, it's, it's, there are some things that we would information that needs to be in public domain that somebody who's, you know, a direct, you know, player would you know, probably want to be removed, but that doesn't mean that it should be. And that's where it's super complicated. And it really does overlap the freedom of information, the freedom of speech. Um, And I thought it was also interesting that, you know, what bubbled up is the cultural differences in implementing this sort of a 
uh, a law. Well, and- I actually, yeah, I thought what I, the part of this that really stuck out to me is just what Liz thought of America, because I, <laughs> I think she, you know, just like Americans think of all British as prim and proper and drinking tea out of a, out of a, you know, fine China. Uh, she was thinking, you know, we, we, we all respect freedom of speech. Um, it, you know, it's fundamental to every action that we take. But uh, in, and in a couple of the examples I said, and I could come up with a whole bunch more, that is just not the approach the tech companies are actually taking. So, you know, and you're hearing about it right now with the calls to, um, to deplatform Joe Rogan, who is obviously the most popular podcaster in the United States because of, of things he is saying. And so people and tech company, and in that case, Spotify seems to be standing behind Joe Rogan, but you see it all the time in terms of YouTube demonetizing and deplatforming content creators. We see it on Google deranking certain search terms in terms of their algorithm. So companies really have no problem implementing this type of censorship. Uh, and they, it, it, it's not against the law to do so because they are not the government. But when you know she looks at the United States, she's seeing a, a society uh, that really, you know, f- above all respects the freedom of speech. Um, and that's that to me, it, you, the, the difference here is that when, in the examples I'm citing, you have corporations just making decisions about what to censor, whereas uh, under a right like the right to be forgotten, you, act, you have governments setting certain parameters of what uh, can be censored. Um, the problem there is just how complex and messy it is. Well, and it's not, there's no formula. There's no formula. And, and when, when you talk about, you know, big platforms, sen- you know, uh, conducting censorship, it's, it's based on, it's not just, it's not based on what's right and wrong. It's based on, you know, who has the loudest voices. It's based on the bottom line. And, you know, you use the example of Spotify and Joe Rogan, that you follow the money, they're going to make more money by having this, this podcast on. So, you know, they're not going to deplatform. So I, I, you know, I think that that's to me that that what the companies are doing on their own is separate from the law. If that makes any sense, it's more based on what goes viral, what makes the money, what people are paying attention to. Right. And um, so what I'm no, but what I'm yeah. saying is, and this wasn't the focus of the interview, no, it but it, it no, but it is what stood out most to me is that this type the the, GD, uh, the the right to be forgotten basically enshrines a certain type of censorship in law, and there she was saying there's opposition, uh, kind of cultural opposition from American companies in implementing this because of a, a right to um, the, 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 the American cultural adherence to freedom of speech, which is a constitutional right, but it's, it's a right against the government stopping your freedom of speech. So what I'm saying is this type of censorship does happen all of the time in the United States and on US-based tech platforms. It doesn't happen from the government, which is what is prohibited, but it happens all the time. And so, uh, you know, I... I feel there is value in having governments step in and at least set some standards for what is censorable content when it comes to some. And, and, and I know that sounds that, that that's in a sense, that's a trigger word for a lot of Americans. But that is what the right to be forgotten is covering. That's what that's what the revenge porn legislation out in California covers. It is a particular type of censorship. And so. There, there is value to me in at least having governments have a role in setting the standards for what type of content should be banned or censored or removed versus just corporations themselves making that decision without any legislative guidance. Well, I'm going to was- stop there because I think <laughs> no. I think we I think we could probably talk about this yeah. ad nauseum for. <laughs> Wait no, no, some but, time. and I, I don't think we came out with any firm answers on this. I mean, I'm glad that we had Liz on because this is a really important subject and we learned a lot. Yeah. And I think what we learned is how complex and messy this is. Well, um, indeed. And I think, I think also, you know, for, for the listeners, it's, it's a, you know, take some time to think about what, you know, n- not necessarily the law and how it would be implemented, but think about, you know, <sighs> Where your where you think for yourself individually, there are boundaries, um, maybe on what 
is okay and just kind of think about you what you had mentioned in the interview that we kind of accept uh technology and all the the good and the bad and and we're just kind of programmed at this point because it is still fairly new to just accept it and i think it's an interesting uh reflection to think about you know individually where 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 those overlaps feel where you feel discomfort with those overlaps and you know hopefully uh, as time goes on, we'll be able to to add some protections. And I do agree with you that the government's probably going to have to make some sort of an outline of where what's okay and what's not that will empower individuals to uh, to to be in a little bit more of a power position about what's uh, what's being posted about them. Yeah. Well. I hope I hope everyone listening had uh, learned learned some things here because again this isn't this isn't a clear cut issue um, but as you say Stephanie I, I I hope that this has given you some food for thought so you you know that that you can start evaluating the issues um, that that we covered because I think they are important they are important for our lives they are important for our identities and they are important for disconnecting thank you Steph thank you well that does it for today's episode. Remember, if you like this show and want to hear more, please subscribe. The Healthier Tech Podcast, available on all major podcasting platforms. And if you have a moment, please also leave a review. Reviews are really critical to help more people find this podcast and learn about the important and undercover topics that we discuss. Also, you can learn more and sign up for our mailing list to get notified when we have new interviews, webinars, ebooks, and sales at shieldyourbody.com. You can also just click that link in the show notes. While you're there at shieldyourbody.com, you can check out our world-class catalog of laboratory-tested EMF and 5G protection products. Don't forget to use promo code POD to save 15% on your first order from shieldyourbody.com with free shipping throughout North America and Europe. Until next time, I'm R Blank, and I want to thank you so much for tuning into the Healthier Tech Podcast. Always remember to shield your body.